last but not least of the incarcerated speakers, um, my fellow Bell student, uh, a passionate writer and even more passionate advocate for new beginnings. Welcome to the stage, Damian Bodie. Domestic violence is a topic that doesn't get discussed with your morning tea. It doesn't, for that matter, come up easy at brunch. Nor does it go down smoothly with your glass of Chardonnay at dinner. Once brought up, it's immediately met with the body language that says, ooh, so you're gonna go there, aren't you? I'm honestly not in the mood to hear about that right now. Understandably so, but we, the unfortunate victims of abuse, need a forum, a platform, a safe haven, for us to speak or cry out loud, to tell our story, not so much so that we could receive a sympathetic air, but rather more so to be seen, to emerge from the shame associated with it, to come out of the blame associated with it. No one wants to hear about domestic violence, especially from a man, and definitely not if that man happens to be a convicted felon for second degree murder. But I'm working on healing, and I like to be heard. I can remember my first real beating. I was five years old, sitting at home next to a friend a year older than me. He was laughing at a joke I told him. When my mother stormed out to me, picked up my hand and slapped it. I guess the joke was inappropriate. But I looked at my hand, then at my friend, and laughed in my mother's face. <laughs> that don't hurt me no more. My friend started laughing too. Now, if there's one thing you don't do to a black mama, it's tell her that her punishment was ineffective. She simply shook her head and backed away. Okay, all right, we'll see. Later that night, when I was heading to bed, my mother stopped me and told me to take a shower first. While I was in the, bath while I was in the shower, my mother snuck into the bathroom. She pulled the shower curtain back and began whipping me repeatedly with an extension cord. The slashes welted up my face, my neck, and my back and arms as the plastic cord met, lashed and wet my mat skin. My mother was a little woman, but not to be trifled with. Growing up, there were times that she gets so mad that she throw knives, cast iron sewing scissors, and a couple of times, a steaming hot iron, all from no more than five feet away from me. I had to dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge in order to not get cut or singed. It's no wonder the movie Dodgeball became one of my favorite movies. My father was more, there were times that, um, there were times that uh, I would get beaten sometimes with uh, wire hangers or belts. I had to go to school wearing long sleeve shirts to cover up the welts and angry bruises. My father was more the uh, passive parent. He never really disciplined me. When I got into fights at school, I was good with him as long as I won. Feeling grazed didn't matter much to him. There was one incident that I can remember that he did get upset. I was 11 or 12 years old, standing in the kitchen, when he stormed in from the living room, came up to me and grabbed me by the collar and started slapping me across my face. I know it was you who drank my liquor, wasn't it? Then slap me once more. Why'd you do it? At this point, tears were streaming out of my eyes when I looked at him and said, I didn't drink your liquor. He rang my collar tighter and snarled in my face. Then why do I smell it on your breath? I looked him in the eyes and said, It's because you're smelling your own breath. And with that, he slowly began to unclench me, then headed back into his den. I never understood why my father would accuse the youngest of his five children of drinking his Johnny Walker. I hated the taste of alcohol then. It boggled my mind why people spend so much time drinking something that tastes so horrible and burns your throat. But I went back to my room and figured if I were gonna get beaten, for stealing and drinking his liquor, then I might as well start to do it. Started a drink then. A cap full of his Johnny Walker, a cap full of his Jack Daniels, 
a cap full of his Rand nephew, Jamaican white rum. It was a thing. All of the best liquors had men's names on it. Since my father had it much to say to me about what it was to be a man, I figured maybe liquor could teach me something about manhood. My fa I started drinking and my father knew, but the guilt associated with knowing that he was the catalyst that inspired my lectures with liquor caused him not to say anything about my drinking. All he could do was to try to hide his alcohol from me. But he and I were a lot alike in some ways. When I used to hide things from myself, oftentimes I would end up losing them in the first place. So I always find a stash. I began drinking regularly and my father said nothing to me about it because he knew without using words that he had inadvertently taught me to be like him. But within my childhood, there was love in the midst of dysfunction. It wasn't wake up beating, come home whipping. I was fed, I was clothed, I went to church, I went to Boy Scouts. I played in North Bronx Little League Baseball from I was in the second grade till I was 16. And my father actually attended all the games, picking me and my friends up, driving us to practice and taking us from the games afterwards. He didn't encourage me, quite the opposite, but he still did attend. I played basketball from junior high school to high school, as, as well as football. I was captain of my high school varsity wrestling team. I went to a prestigious Catholic school, Mount St. Michael Junior High School Academy, joining the ranks of Denzel Washington and Sean Puffy Combs. I went to family trips to Bahamas and Jamaica. My parents, were legal immigrants that arrived here on a work visa in the 70s. My father worked his way up from being a truck driver to a Greyhound bus driver to a New York sanitation truck driver. My mother was a seamstress and a wedding cake baker who worked from home. And yes, she made miracles happen with her money. She never once charged anyone the true value of all her hard work, no matter how hard I protested. She cooked for it and attended every one of my parent teachers meeting while my father sat in the car waiting outside. But he did pick me up from wherever I was at and would drive me to wherever I needed to go. How was I to know that the way I was raised, wrapped in normalcy, was anything but? I mean, my mother, she's the matriarch of my entire West Indian family. How was I to know? But I knew. I can remember sitting on the bottom bunk at Five Points Correctional Facility as my bunkie stood in front of me we were talking and I was discussing my childhood, laughing as I told her incidents of how my mother would beat me relentlessly. I remember him staring at me as I laughed about it, my desensitization to violence. After I finished, he just shook his head and simply said, your mom was a bug out. <laughs> then it hit me. What you say about my mama? <laughs> I mean, seriously though, she still is my mother. So after I blew up at him, I sat back down on the mattress at the bottom bunk and it started to sink in. I started to replay things that an ex-girlfriend of mine in college said as I was breaking up with her. She cried, and you better get some help too because your parents jacked you up. I thought long and hard about it and wrestled with the idea that I am a victim of unintentional child abuse. Times are different now, and had I done any of the things done to me, to my then four-year-old daughter, I would have been arrested for that. But I forgive my parents and love them. They worked out their differences, and now that four-year-old turned 15, lives at home with them. Yet, here I am. Numerous studies have pointed out the link between past childhood trauma and later incarceration. According to a national survey, 70% of youth and residential placement had some type of past traumatic experience with 30% experiencing frequent and or injurious physical and or sexual abuse. Overall, 68% of adult male felons in New York have reported some form of early childhood victimization before the age of 12. The most common type, physical abuse. New York has an incarceration rate of 376 per 100,000 people. 
including jails, prisons, juvenile justice facilities, and immigration detentions, which means that it locks up a higher percent of its people more than any democracy on earth. There are a lot of people in prison, and according to those statistics, most of them were helpless, innocent victims at one point in time throughout their childhood. That's why the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act was created, was passed in 2019. Because past trauma can have a lingering effect on a person's life. This act allows victims of domestic violence to receive resentences if certain criteria are met. I've only just started to deal with the trauma that I experienced as a young man, as a, as an adult, as a kid. Therapy has helped some, but it wasn't enough. We need to have a program in prison that deals with domestic violence survivors and enables us to deal with our trauma and heal. How can prison possibly rehabilitate us if we don't address the issues in our life that may have very well contributed to the reason why we may be here in the first place. Thank you.